We are called to not give up. We are watching people give up at an alarming rate on many, many things. On relationships, on each other, on businesses, on church, on God. But we are called to not give up because there is a reward. I'm going to play a video for you and uh, uh, my friends and family who have been with me for a while. Um, you would have heard this, this story and maybe you've heard it anyway, but it's, it's a good one. And then I will uh, carry on. Thank you, Sam. A number of years ago, in a Baptist church in Crystal Palace in southern London, the Sunday morning service was closing and a stranger stood up at the back, raised his hand, he said, excuse me, pastor, can I share a little testimony? The pastor looked at his watch, he said, you've got three minutes. And this man proceeded, he said, I've just moved into this area. I used to live in another part of London. I came from Sydney in Australia. And just a few months back, I was visiting some relatives and I was walking down George Street. You know where George Street is in Sydney? And he said, a strange little white-haired man stepped out of a shop doorway put a pamphlet in my hand and he said, excuse me, sir, are you saved? If you die tonight, are you going to heaven? He said, I was astounded by those words. Nobody had ever told me that. I thanked him courteously and all the way on British Airlines back to Heathrow, this puzzled me. I called a friend who lived in this new area where I'm living now and thank God he was a Christian. He led me to Christ. That Baptist pastor flew to Adelaide in Australia the next week and 10 days later, a woman came to him for counseling and he wanted to establish where she stood with Christ. And she said, I used to live in Sydney and just a couple of months back I was visiting friends in Sydney doing some last minute shopping down George Street and a strange little white haired man, elderly man, stepped out of a shop doorway, offered me a pamphlet and said, excuse me ma'am, are you saved? If you die tonight, are you going to heaven? She said, I was disturbed by those words. When I got back to Adelaide, I knew this Baptist church was on the next block from me and I sought out the pastor and he led me to Christ. Now this London pastor was now very puzzled. Twice within a fortnight he'd heard the same testimony. He then flew to preach in the Mount Pleasant Baptist Church in Perth. And when his teaching series was over, the senior elder of that church took him out for a meal. And he said, mate, how'd you get saved? He said, I grew up in this church from the age of 15 through Boys Brigade. Never made a commitment to Jesus, just hopped on the bandwagon like everybody else. And because of my business ability, grew up to a place of influence. I was on a business outing in Sydney just three years ago and an obnoxious, spiteful little man stepped out of a stop shop doorway, offered me a religious pamphlet and accosted me with a question. Excuse me, sir, are you saved? If you die tonight, are you going to heaven? He said, I tried to tell him I was a Baptist elder. He wouldn't listen to me. He said, I was seething with anger all the way home on Qantas to, to Perth. He said, I told my pastor thinking he would sympathize with me and my pastor agreed. He had been disturbed for years knowing that I didn't have a relationship with Jesus and he was right. And my pastor led me to Jesus just three years ago. Now this London preacher flew back to the UK and was speaking at the Keswick Convention in the Lake District and he threw in these three testimonies. At the close of his teaching session, four elderly pastors came up and said, we got saved between 25 and 35 years ago, respectively, through that little man on George Street giving us a tract and asking us that question. Well, eight months later, that Crystal Palace Baptist pastor was ministering in Sydney and he said to the Baptist minister, do you know a little man, an elderly little man, who witnesses and hands out tracts on George Street? And he said, I do. His name is Mr. Genor, G-E-N-O-R. But I don't think he does it anymore. He's too frail and elderly. The man said, I want to meet him. Two nights later, they went around to this little apartment, knocked on the door, and this tiny, frail little man opened the door. And as he sat with them, this London preacher told him all these accounts over the previous three years. This little man sat with tears running down his cheeks. He said, my story goes like this. He said, I was a rating on an Australian warship and I lived a reprobate life. And one of my colleagues whom I gave literal hell was there to help me. He led me to Jesus and the change in my life was night to day in 24 hours. And I was so grateful to God. I promised God that I would share Jesus in a simple witness with at least 10 people a day as God gave me strength. And he said, in 40 years of doing this, I've never heard of one single person coming to Jesus until today. Do you know, I would say that has to be commitment. That has to be just sheer gratitude and love for Jesus to do that, not hearing of any results. That's 146,100 people. That simple little non-charismatic Baptist man influenced 
somehow to Jesus. And I believe what God was showing that Baptist minister was the tip of the tip of the tip of the tip of this iceberg. Goodness knows how many more had been arrested for Christ and were doing huge jobs out in the mission field. Mr. Genor died two weeks later. And can you imagine the reward he went home to in heaven? Nobody except a little group of Baptists in southern Sydney knew about Mr. Genor. But I'll tell you, his name was famous in heaven. Isn't that incredible? In 40 years, he never heard of one salvation. Talk about doing stuff without uh, seeing the fruit, but just doing it because of the passion uh, in their heart. And there's something that I want to do. And uh, uh, Dina, why don't you come up here? Pastor Arthur, why don't you come stand here with me uh, 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 for a moment? But uh, that won't happen on our watch, right? That... that uh, the people who have ministered in our lives don't get to know the fruit in their life. And if you would stand with me in this place and let us celebrate our pastor here, please. And I don't know if, if Bubba's here, but if you're here, please. And uh, all the Morgan family, please uh, come on down. All you guys, Chip, Danielle, come down. You guys have been ministering and you have been faithful and you have shown commitment and we are riding off all of that. And uh, we want to celebrate you guys and thank you. And uh, someone is getting you free bluebell after this. <laughs> Let us celebrate. Thank you. We love you guys. Thank you for not giving up and being our little Mr. Genor, hey? You have no idea the lives that you have impacted. Uh, don't just, what you see with your eyes and hear with your ears, it is far bigger. I promise you that. Amen. I had a very short sermon uh, before all of that, but we will uh, wrap it up here with the parable of the, the widow who would not give up. Luke 18 verse 1 says this. One day Jesus told his disciples a, short, a story to show that you should always pray and never give up. We have to understand that free will and our involvement matters. Right? There's, a, there's a, a rumor out there that it's just up to God and only what God wants happens. Well, then why did Jesus teach them to pray and not give up? If God was just going to do what God was going to do. No, because God uses free will. He uses those who would get involved and things change and happen. That's why we read in Galatians that you will reap if you don't give up. It's not just God's plan. It's God's plan involving you. Isn't that so beautiful that we have been invited? Think about it like this. Church on a Sunday is going to happen with or without you. But with you, some special things can happen that wouldn't happen if you weren't here. Right? If Larry wasn't at church today, that's one less hug that I would have got. So it matters. It, it matters. It, 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 it makes a difference if you, were, if you were greeted at the door, right? It matters that you showed up. Mo at church today. God wants to use your life. He's inviting you in, but he's asking you to not give up. And then he also gives you the strength. He's the Gatorade. He's the ability but you make that choice. So he teaches them to pray and never give up. Okay, verse 2. There was a judge in a certain city, he said, who, who neither feared God nor cared about people. So he's establishing this was not a good guy. Like this was the worst of the worst. I loved last week when Bible was preaching. I thought it was absolutely hilarious that it was sinners and tax collectors. Like I hadn't made that connection before. I loved that. Like it's even worse than a sinner. So he neither feared God nor cared about people. Just to establish, this was like as bad as it got. A widow of that city came to him repeatedly saying, give me justice in this dispute with my enemy. The judge ignored her for a while, but finally he said to himself, I do not fear God or care about people, but this woman is driving me crazy. I'm going to see that she gets justice because she's wearing me out 
with a constant request. Carrying on. Then the Lord said, learn a lesson from this unjust judge. Even he rendered a decision in the end. So don't you think God will surely give justice to his people who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will grant justice to them quickly. But when the Son of Man returns, how many will he find on the earth who have faith? And here he's defining faith as those who do not give up. Regardless of rejection, 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 rejection. When I read about people who, who do not have God, who have stayed the course. Have you ever read the story of uh, Honda? Like the company Honda? It's insane. I mean, this guy rebuilt his company several times. And just as it got rebuilt again, another world war broke out, bombed it again. I mean, it was, and he kept going and kept going. How much more? Those who call upon the name of the Lord. We are so advantaged. You want to talk about privileged? We should wake up going like, wow, I'm privileged because of the Lord. But that privilege is available to anybody who will call upon his name. So here's the thing. When you read this, depending on how you see God, you go like, why does God make them beg? Is, is, he, is he, like we've got to beg God and we've got to like wear him down and like annoy him until he's like, okay, <laughs> I will, I'll answer your prayer. Please just don't pray anymore. Like I can't sleep. <laughs> no, that's not the heart of God. And I want to, I want to show it to you from uh, the book of Daniel. Just one little excerpt from when he was fasting and praying. Um, uh, verse 2 says, uh, and then the vision came to me. I, Daniel, had been in mourning for three weeks. How long? For three weeks. But then the angel came and said, don't be afraid, Daniel. Since the first day you began to pray for understanding, and listen to this, and humble yourself before God, your request was heard in heaven. Immediately. Immediately. Listen to this. Um, but for 21 days, the spirit um, prince of the kingdom of Persia blocked my way. If you don't think that there's spiritual warfare going on, have a look at that scripture. He waited three weeks for a reply, but it wasn't because God was dragging his feet or making him beg. Immediately, something was put into motion. Once again, there's free will at work. When he prayed, Something happened in heaven. Isn't that amazing? And doesn't that go with what we uh, were told? That what we bind on earth will be? And what we loose on earth will be? We play a major role in what is happening on this earth. And Satan wants us to, number one, believe he, he isn't real. And number two, believe that we can't make any difference. That God's just going to steamroll whatever he wants. That's not what we see in the Old Testament. And it's definitely not what we see in the New Testament. That's why he taught them to pray and do not give up. And pray and do not give up. And it's not because God doesn't care. And it's not because God is slow and he's deaf and his arm is short. And all the other things that he tells us. Because he knows we will think these things. It's because there is a war going on. And there are other factors that we can't even comprehend sometimes. Have you ever judged a situation completely wrong? And you were certain that you were reading this situation right, only to realize you were completely wrong? Anyone besides me? I wonder how many times we've done this with God. God, I don't know why you're not answering my prayer. Just <laughs> slow your roll and trust in the goodness of God. It is I think it's so hard to have faith if we don't believe that God is good and that he is truly thinking good towards us and for our best, not just his best. Many times religious, religion makes us to think we're just a cog, a, a, a dispensable cog in the wheel, but it's, it's just God just doing what he wants to do. He's just like a big CEO and he'll burn through whatever employees he needs to to achieve his purpose. And if you get killed along the way, don't worry, there's someone else to take your place. That's, that is not his heart. How do we know that? Because when Jesus walked the earth, he had compassion on people who meant nothing in society. 
blind Bartimaeus? Who cares about him? What, what good was he going to go do on this earth? No, because he called upon Jesus and Jesus was moved by his faith. Peter's mother-in-law had a fever. <laughs> the son of God, okay, let's just sort this out so you can make lunch. He cares about the big. He cares about the small. Of course, he cares what's happening in the government, but he also cares, as we tell our kids, when you've stubbed your toe, he cares. If you don't believe he cares about a stubbed toe, you won't believe he cares about, about the bigger things either. Hebrews eleven six, and it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that he exists. Listen to this. And we hear this often in this church that I'm so grateful for and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. Why do I not give up? Because I know that God is good and he's leading me and guiding me and somewhere along the line, there's gonna be breakthrough. I don't know how, I don't know how. It's like hanging on a board sometimes in the middle of the ocean at night. You can't see land, any direction. You're exhausted, you're tired, and you're believing somehow that God is going to rescue you. But in your mind, there's no possible way. Like, how could this possibly happen? This is where faith kicks in. And this is where endurance and perseverance comes to play. I've told you the story about uh, um, one of the, the, oh, his name's just, gone out of my head, George Mueller, who started an orphanage and he sat all the kids down for a meal and their plates were empty and their knife and fork uh, and I said, let's, let's pray and thank God for the food and little Oliver Twist. <laughs> it's like, uh, we don't have any food. I don't know if anybody's noticed, but we have no food. And he said, God gave me a promise that he will take care of the orphan. And I don't know how, but God is going to take care of this meal today. This is a true story. And a bakery truck broke down outside the orphanage. Knock, knock, knock on the door during their prayer. And he said, I'm not going to make it in time to where I need to deliver all this food. It's going to spoil. Why don't you have all of this? And there they ate fresh baked goods. God is great. He's giving me chocolate cake. Right? It was... That's faith. Listen, all our situations are relative. The things my son is facing is no smaller than the things that I'm facing. And the things my wife is facing is no smaller. Just because on a world scale, when it comes to your heart and your world and your belief, God sees it as just as important. I know that. I, I, I know how much God cares, but Satan wants to rob us of that to tell you God doesn't care about that. God doesn't care about you. God's angry at you. He's mad at you. He's, he's disappointed in you. If you've ever felt that, it's a lie. Because he removes your sins as far as the east is from the west. That's infinite. And Satan wants to bring up our past and our past. Oh, God's not going to answer that because you're a sinner. God's not going to answer that because you did this. God's not going to answer that. No, he is a rewarder. He is a rewarder. He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So Daniel humbles himself and immediately the Lord comes into action. And then there was a battle in the heavenly realms. And because he didn't give up, that angel eventually broke through. There's some prayers that we gave up on that we shouldn't have. But I don't say that in a condemnation way. I say that for a future get up and let's go. Um, when I was young, I, I think I've, I've shared the story, but I was in um, the national finals for the 1500 meters. It was a big deal in South Africa, right? If it was on America, there would be hundreds of thousands of people and it would be on national TV in South Africa like my mom was there. And, uh, you know, maybe 60 other people. But <laughs> anyway, I was in the race and I was on the last, I was on the second last lap and I was hurting so badly. 
so bad. I mean, I, was, I couldn't breathe. My legs were tired. My arms were tired. The pace was just so much. You want to know something? And the moment I stepped out of the race to quit, like all the pain of my body just went, oh. but you know, there was another pain that fired up and it was the one in my heart. That pain was so bad that the next year when I was in the final, all that body pain came, was there again. But I did not want that pain of quitting. And I finished that race and won and became the national champion in the 1500 meters. But God is calling us not to quit, but we know the, the taste of quitting. We know how it tastes. It's not good. It's not who God has called us to be. There are people that, that we have prayed for to come to salvation, and it seems like the more we pray, the worse they got. It's like, maybe I should stop praying. because like. <laughs> but we don't give up. The amount of stories I've heard of people coming to faith at the end of their life, my dad being one of them. My mom never quit in praying for my dad. And we were like, just commit his soul to... <laughs> He's clearly one of those ones that Scripture talks about, you know? The ones that can't be saved. <laughs> My neighbor, she's definitely one. She was chosen to go straight to hell, you know? <laughs> we don't give up. When God has given you a vision, a dream, when you see a Scripture that's just not coming to life in your life, don't give up. Don't quit. We read it with Abraham and Sarah. Sarah's like, Abraham, maybe you were confused, you know? <laughs> maybe God forgot that he was going to do it. Maybe we should do it this way. Don't quit. There's something very key. And there's um, in James 3, 1 verse 3 to 4 that says, For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. Your endurance can't grow unless your faith is tested. Your faith can't be tested if everything's always sunshine and nothing ever goes wrong. You don't need faith when everything is going right. When your business is rocking, you don't need faith for God to help your business. When your marriage is peachy, you don't need faith for God to change your heart or whatever it might be. It's in those dark times that you need faith. And that's when endurance has a chance to grow. And we need endurance. Because when endurance is developed, it says, you will be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. We do ourselves no favors to only put ourselves in situations where we are not tested. Where we are not growing. When we are not developed. Nothing, we, we can't grow out of those situations. So when those times happen, we count it all joy. Lord, thank you that this is an opportunity for me to grow, to mature, for sin to be removed from my life, for me to be refined. And I'll close with these six things. Endurance, perseverance. It makes sure that what we are praying for is God's will. Have you ever prayed for something only to find out later that you were so grateful that that did not happen? Please, Lord. My mom reminded me the other day, I try to start my journey in, in Florida. Nothing that there's, there's nothing wrong with Florida. But God wanted me in Colorado at that time. And he shut every door. And I was trying to fight him. He was trying to close the door. And I was trying to push it open. And I was like, it's the devil. <laughs> God's like, it's me. Yeah. It helped. Perseverance, endurance, it helps us to make sure this is truly God that is calling us to this thing. It makes us sure that this is what we want. Sometimes we're like, I want to be an astronaut. And they're like, okay, you need to be able to hold your breath for 27 minutes. And it's like, okay, I want to be a fireman. <laughs> it helps us to really know is this what we truly want? Perseverance will test you to make sure, like those guys on alone who are like, oh, I'll do anything for a million dollars. And then three weeks later, it's like, okay, I just realized I won't do anything for a million dollars. Number three, it trains us to look beyond our circumstances. 
if you've endured for a time, you know that you've had to look past your current circumstances and look to God and your circumstances no longer become a problem. They no longer determine what God can do because you've learned to look beyond them. Your finances, the provision, what's happening in the world. Tomorrow they are arresting Donald Trump because the banking system is crashing. And we got a, a spy balloon, you know, coming from... <laughs> you have to look beyond all that nonsense and look to God who is our provider, who is stable. You know what? Heaven is not affected by America's banking system. Peter found gold in the mouth of a fish. Like, like Elijah was fed by ravens. Just know if it gets really bad, we can pray for ravens. We can pray for manna. Hear what I'm saying? Like God has things that He wants to unleash that we haven't even imagined yet for those who will trust and believe Him. It develops our faith. It builds endurance and it makes us perfect and complete. But here, here's the thing. I want to go back to that, that uh, example I said in the beginning of being alone. Many of us quit because we don't have somebody to raise our hands, to speak encouragement and into us. You're not stronger by yourself and isolating yourself. And Satan loves to do that to people. When do we isolate? When we feel bad, when we're ashamed, when we in sin, whatever it might be, we isolate. It's the worst time to isolate because that's when you need people to put their arms around you and encourage you and pick you back up. Please don't isolate. You are in danger when you isolate. Reach out. If it's on the app, if it's on text, even if you don't know anybody and you knew, just reach out and you will be surprised that it's nothing like what your mind is telling you. People are going to say, oh, people are going to judge me. They're going to say, nonsense. People are going to love you. They're going to lift your hands. They're going to pray for you. And you're going to come out better than you went in. But don't give up. But you don't give up when you are in community. We are called to be in community. There are no lone rangers in the body of Christ. Even Jesus sent the disciples out two by two. And at his hardest time, he didn't go alone. He took the disciples with him to pray for him while he prayed. Please wait here and pray. He took them with. Everybody needs somebody. Don't be alone. You do not have to be. Amen. If you would stand with me, please. If you don't know Jesus, like Mr. Kenner was saying, and you died tonight, do you know where you're going to go? You can know where you're going to go, but it's, more, it's not just about where you're going to go at the end of the life. It's how you can live your life. And like that one example, the, the Baptist elder that grew up in the church and yet didn't know Jesus. Maybe that's you. You come to church, you know all the things. You have three versions of the Bible. You have a cross necklace. But do you really know Jesus? Have you experienced His love? If the answer is no, that can happen today. But you have to humble yourself. And you have to say, please, Jesus, would you help me? Would you save me? Would you rescue me? Forget what, other peop what you think other people are going to think. Man, the amount of times that we are wrong in our mind. So, if that's you, afterwards when we dismiss, come, come, let's pray uh, together. Just grab any, any one of the leadership and say, please tell me about Jesus. But he's as close as the mention of his name. Jesus, please save me. I believe you are the Savior. And he will come in and he will transform your life. If you feel like quitting, if you feel like giving up, if it feels too much, we are here. Let us pray together. Don't go it alone. This word is for you. This word is for me. This word is for this time. The world seems crazy, but God is still the same. He's still the same. And I want you to just for a moment, no matter how crazy America is getting, there are other places in the world that have been a thousand times more crazy all your life that you didn't know about. And yet there are Christians there calling on the name of the Lord and He is coming through for them. 
I think this just happened. God woke up one morning. It's like, oh my gosh, what happened in America? The darker it is, the more grace there is. And where does grace come through? It's flowing from Jesus through us. So the more we pray and we don't give up, we are the light to the world. Do not put your light away. And shining your light doesn't mean fighting with people on Facebook, okay? That's not shining your light. (laughs) Invite people to your house. Be kind where you can. Give where you can. Love where you can. Be like Mr. Genel in the simplest way, telling people about Jesus and showing it. And your work will be rewarded if you do not give up. Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand.